depression, the panic was still leaving, uh, depre the, pe the depression for the panic was lingering. And so in 1880, Democrats thought they had a chance. That's how they drew the 80 back then. They, it was off balance, so you emphasize the end of the decade. <laughs> yes, that's a simple thing. So, 1880, the Republicans could not pick anybody. Their convention was a disaster. Grant tried to run again. All these people ran again. They were tainted by credit over the air. They needed somebody who didn't have a record. What do you call somebody who doesn't have a record? Dark Horse. And they found a prominent representative from Ohio, James Garfield. Dark Horse, no record. Now, who? what was the name of the, uh, Grant was it, very conservative or laissez-faire Republicans? We're called what? Stalwarts, yeah. yeah. What do they call ones who, they, they agreed with them on everything but civil service reform? Half-breeds. Half Did you say half back? Yeah. <laughs> I like that. You know, it's half something. Garfield was kind of both. He was, he really was more of a half-breed. But to appease the stalwart, they had to find somebody who actually didn't have an elected post. He was the head of the customs house. He kind of personified all the crookedness of the government jobs. His VP candidate was Chester Arthur, a stalwart who got rich collecting tariffs, you know, pocketing money to not charge tariffs for certain things. Chester Arthur. It's always a bad sign for the president in this era when I name the vice president, isn't it? It's a bad sign. The Democrats really see an opening. And they came up with a clever ploy. They nominated a Civil War hero, Winfield Scott Hancock, the man who was who held and was severely wounded holding the center of the Union line at Pickett's charge. This great Civil War hero. The Democrats had been tainted by the Civil War for a long time because remember the South were Democrats for lots of reasons, but they were tainted by that. So, okay, we'll pick a great hero of the United States Army. How could you go against that? Well, the Republicans did. And they did in a way that was duplicitous, dishonest, horrible, slanderous, and incredibly effective. It was called, yeah, it's called waving the bloody shirt. And it was something that started before, but it became... 1880 became an art form. Republicans, it actually literally started by uh, Republicans infiltrating Democratic rallies. And they would bring a shirt, they would hide it in a briefcase, and it would be covered with like pig's blood or cow's blood. And it would be a shirt that represented wounded U.S. soldiers who died in the War of the Rebellion, in the Civil War. And they would wave it at Democratic functions, waving the bloody shirt, saying, you're the ones who did this. You're the ones who killed citizens of the United States in your rebellion. Now, think about it for a second. Hancock's great strength was as a Civil War hero for the United States. But because of the bloody shirt, it took that away from him. Isn't that brilliant? Okay, how does that take that away from him? Because every time he would bring up the Civil War, here comes the bloody shirt. Oh, sure, whatever you did, Hancock, but all your supporters are Democrats and no rebels. And so you're almost a traitor by being a party for the for running with the rebels. Yeah. Is, uh, was Rutherford, was he the one that they all been saying that third was a different one? What? Well, there's an element. That oh, yes. no, that's a sign. It's Rutherford B. Hayes or something. Right. But yeah, there was a scientist named Rutherford. Last name. His surname was. Okay, it took me a second. Okay. <laughs> and waving the bloody shirt. And this is still done today. Find something to taint them with. Uh, for years, the Republican Party, after the revolution, or um, after the uh, Great Depression, going to be tainted as the party of the bankers who got rich and why everyone sucked in the Great Depression. Democrats are going to the bloody shirt will be that they're soft on communism. Uh, the best known example in your lifetime happened in 2004, when George W. Bush was running for re-election, and it was right during the Iraq War. Literally, Iraq was kind of falling apart, and so the war was a major issue. And it, uh, the reason they, that we, the United States got into the war, those reasons were falling apart too. 
the Democrats nominated John Kerry, and John Kerry was a war hero in Vietnam, three times awarded, twice wounded, and supporters of Bush put out these ads saying that Kerry's war record was fake and made up. It wasn't true, but they took away that great strength of his. It's now called swift voting now. Oh yeah. It's technically not illegal for public figures. Now in Britain, it'd be illegal, but not in the US. And uh, Swift Boat is a small little patrol boat that Kerry was on. You have to be pretty crazy to be on one of those because you can't hide. It, it, you know, that it happens to this day. You know, they took its strength and put it away. No, they were they were they didn't use, the pontoon boats weren't used very much. And so so Garfield won. And when Garfield was Oh, by the way, what did we call this? I relate, relate wave in the bloody shirt. Oh, isn't that amazing? Did I just blow your mind? Yes. Oops, I just, Taylor, did I blow your mind? Thank you. Almost immediately, Garfield, who became president, was overwhelmed by job seekers. Overwhelmed by it. And if you remember back to... Andrew Jackson, this was called patronage. All these people had government, or they claimed to work for the Republican Party to get Garfield elected, and now they came in and demanded jobs. They demanded it, and they would line up every morning, four days a week, and line up in front of the, at the door of the White House, knock on the door, they'd go in, wait in line again, and then go into the president's office, pre oval office, go into the president's office and ask for a job. This happened every day while Garfield was president until he was shot. Yes. Hmm? They only allowed him four days a week. And this happened four days a week, every day. That's what he did for half his day. Now, this all stems back to remember Andrew Jackson called it the spoil system. You help me, I help you. Well, now they're all coming in. Demand, I'm a Republican, give me a job. One of these guys was frankly a lunatic by the name of Charles Guiteau. And Charles Guiteau was from Ohio. He claimed he helped Garfield's campaign, even though he wrote a couple of letters to the editor. He showed up in Washington, D.C., in fact, abandoned his home in Cleveland. Guiteau, Charles Guiteau, showed up in D.C. and expected to be made ambassador to France. <laughs> Garfield had no idea who this guy was. He came to see the president twice. So he came into the White House twice. After the second time, Garfield said, don't let that man in again. And Guteau ran out of money, was living on the streets. And in September, decided that this was a massive plot against him. Garfield, every weekend, went back home to Ohio. His family didn't leave their family home in Ohio. So he could take out the train and go back to Ohio. There was no guards for the president. I know you might be thinking, wait a second. Lincoln was assassinated. They thought that was an aberration of the Civil War. And so he would just walk alone or with a friend to the train station, get on a train, just regular, regular seat, and ride back to Ohio. Guteau waited for him and shot him in the belly. Right there. Lodged in his stomach. Kind of an angle, so it went in. He did not die right away. And they, yes, they could have given him some morphine, but he didn't want it. And at first they were going to let it go, but then he decided, no, we got to get the bullet out. Well, how they got the bullet out back then is they had these long brass prongs. And they would stick them into the bullet hole and hope they heard a clink. Well, bullets don't go straight. When they enter the body, they move. <laughs> and so they're just jabbing, and they did this for a month and a half. They tortured this poor man. He finally died. If they wouldn't have done nothing, he might have lived. And they were just learning about disinfecting, but they didn't do it yet. I mean, they're just learning it. So how would they clean the prod? <laughs> and a couple other things. Alexander Graham Bell tried to try to primitive, he invented a primitive metal detector. That didn't work. There it is. Mm, oh, that's the spleen. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and so what happened was. Garfield died in office. Arthur is now president. Arthur kind of represented patronage. His whole life was 
He was a very rich man. He had over 10,000 pairs of pants. Yes, very. He was obsessed with pants. He would change pants 10, 15 times a day. Well, I only do it five or six. He would do 10 or 15. Yes. No, not really. And part of the problem was not only that, but there's such a fight between the stalwarts and the half or something like that. And so Garfield and something had to be done about the civil service. Something. So ironically, it's Chester A. Arthur that would sign civil service reform. 1883, it's called the Pendleton Act. And the Pendleton Act is still the law of the land today. It creates a professional civil service. Federal government jobs, most of them are now professional. They're perfect. 1883. That's how they made eights back then if there's a tree following it. And you know, it's like that I after E thing. Okay, so you should be writing this down. High level positions. High level positions are appointed, are patrons, they're appointed by the president. But most physicians, and they have to take a test to prove that they're worthy, worthy, qualified, worthy, <laughs> qualified. <laughs> I am worthy. Beats of strength. So yeah. <laughs> I like that. I like that. That would be good. So yeah, all the federal government jobs for the mailman, so or they work for the Social Security Administration. Um, heck, even off the officer or not commissioned officer in the army have to pass the civil service. They're all civil servants. And the idea is they can't be fired then. Just because of political changes. So they're professional, they're not worried about their job. There's some good and bad things about this. And almost every state followed it. Actually, every state did. So Montana has something very similar. And this is a government town. There's a lot of federal government and state government jobs in there. So you probably have family members that might have these jobs and they had to go through a civil service exam, professional civil service. It's ironic that it's Arthur. Now, this is a big reform. But what does that do for farmers? Not really anything. It's a reform. It's a good thing. But for the most part, things haven't changed. And so in 1884, after the disaster of Arthur and Hayes, the Democrats looked good. And that is when the Democrats nominated Grover Cleveland. Grover Cleveland was perfect. He was a dark horse. He was the dark horse. Horses, dark horse. I mean, he had no record at all. Within two years, he went from being private citizen to mayor of Buffalo, New York, to governor of New York, to president. Within two years, and so he he could you could do imply anything for him. They imply he was a free trader. Free trader means they want to do watch the tariff, lower, at least lower it. They could apply or imply that he's going to do something to help the farmers, something about the railroad corporations. He can do something. And he's my great, great, great uncle. That is actually true. Right? That is actually true. If I could pick a president to be my great, great, great uncle, it probably would not be Grover Cleveland, but you can't pick your relatives, especially if you weren't alive. And so, yeah. That's who it is. Uncle Grover. I mean, I would be someone cool like that. William Henry Harris. No. Reagan. And let me show you very quickly what Uncle Grover looked like because he was a bachelor. He was a confirmed bachelor. He was considered the most handsome man in America. I know. You're looking at looking at me. The resemblance is shocking. Now we'll come back to this. I know some of you are swooning. Some of you are jealous. I understand completely. And so Cleveland became, oh, the Republicans, they can't nominate Arthur again. And so, once again, the fight between the stalwarts, it's a real issue now. And so the Republicans nominated a very influential congressman with a long record, James G. Blaine. Now, 
Blaine had been in Congress for a long time, and that's one of those things that it seems like it should be an asset, but it's not. Because now he's got a long record. And part of that record, he's tainted by the credit mobile air scandal. And so the Democrats immediately jumped onto this. You can't trust James G. Blaine. And came up with a very clever little slogan for Blaine. Yes. Is that how to just say you're a participant or a person or something in Congress for a while? It's really hard to do. There's there's only been a few. Heck, there hasn't been a president from the House since the 19th century. There hasn't been a so most there's only been two presidents from the Senate, one or two terms. Yeah, well, that's what that's the great advantage Obama had. Obama was a little bit like Cleveland. He had only been in the Senate. For, he was in the Senate for less than two years when he announced he was running. So he had virtually no record. So most everyone that becomes president either is the only House or Senate or is in there for this. Almost, yeah. Almost, most of them are governors. Governor is a kind of separate time. Uh, and John Kennedy was from the Senate, and Kennedy had been in the Senate for a while, but he had no record. Kennedy for health reasons and because he was a playboy. <laughs> he was an interesting man. He had no right. Okay, so back to this. So James, the Democratic slogan because of the credit mobilier, it's catchy. You ready for it? James G. Are you breaking pins? Are you attacking him with your pen? No. <laughs> Take responsibility. James G. Blaine. The Continental Liar from the State of Maine. You like it? You like it? No, you don't need to know that, but that's because he was tainted with the credit mobilier. But the confirmed bachelor, James, or Uncle Grover. What confirmed bachelor was that? It was an old saying, just he had, it was always like, I'm not going to get married. You got on your chest. He had a child out of wedlock. <laughs> that was incredibly scandalous then. It'd be. It'd be still be scandalous now, a little bit, but not near as much as then. And so you know what the Republicans came up for this? It'd be pictures of little babies. And the baby would be saying, Ma, Ma, where's my pa? <laughs> Wait for it. Gone to the White House. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> yeah, that, kind of a struggle for the line of pa. <laughs> <laughs> It didn't work. <laughs> James G. Blaine lost. Why I circle Blaine? I meant to circle Cleveland, so you notice how I adjusted. Uncle Grover won. The first Democrat elected since 1856. Did the tariff change? No. Nothing changed. But while he's president, remember those Granger laws. What court case threw out the Granger laws? Something railroad. Something railroad. Wabash railroad cases, Wabash versus Illinois. 1886. And now farmers are furious. A lot of farmers voted Democratic. And they're thinking, we got to do something. Or who knows how politics would change. And that is when, in 1887, Congress would pass the Interstate Commerce Act, which created, this is what we have to get down, what I mentioned in that document, the Interstate Commerce Commission, or simply the ICC, the Interstate Commerce Commission. This is something relatively new. The United States copied of Britain had one. There's I mean, there a couple ones in other countries. But what it was is the president would appoint a commission. And this commission would regulate railroad rates. It's a big deal. They're going to regulate railroad rates. Remember that price discrimination, monopoly, big haul. Uh, big haul, small haul, long haul, short haul. It's going to regulate it all for the whole country. Now, this Congress has the committee or the the power to make this commission. The president can appoint this commission. How did railroads react when this first came, when first was debated? Uh, and conservatives were very upset by this too. They want laws I fair. We can do whatever we want. That is where we get document E. It's a little bit off in their statement here. 
from Richard Olney for the B&M Railroad, Baltimore, Maine. Let me read you a little bit of that document that you read. The commission, ICC, as it functions, has now been limited by the courts, is or can be made of great use for the railroads. What he's telling the other railroads, wait a second, we can use this. We'll give them their commission. We'll say it regulates railroad rates. But let's look down a little bit further. It thus becomes sort of a barrier between railroad corporations and the people. Protection against hasty and crude legislation hostile to railroad interest. They can always say, oh, don't complain. We have a commission. So they thought it would be like a buffer. Uh, change anything and, just buffer. and this is the last part, because you're exactly right. The part of wisdom is to not destroy the commission, but to utilize it. Support the commission. Let's make the commission. We'll tell people we're doing the reform, and then make sure the commission is what? Yes. Useless. It doesn't function. Yes? Could they also just make, like, so all the railroads are really expensive then, too? Yeah, we'll get to it. You're almost on the right track. Two things happen. First off, regulate railroad rates, they had no power to enforce. The law was written in such a way that there's no power to force. So all they could do is say, if they want railroads to lower their rates, all they can say is, hey, you, cut it out. And the railroads could ignore it. But then the next thing, it's a commission appointed by the president. What kind of people can the president appoint to this commission? Conservatives. Conservatives who want no regulation, or just even more blatant. Let's just put railroad men on the commission to regulate railroad rates. There's a term for it. Let's have the fox. Guard the hen house. But that, of course, would never happen, right? Never. Every president from then on who doesn't want to regulate it would put railroad men in. And so they would make sure that the rates are all high. And then they could say, hey, that's the fair rate decided by the ITC. There's a name for it. It's called regulatory capture. Regulatory capture, where the very same people that are supposed to be regulated are on the commission. They've captured it. Happens all the time. The best example of that in your lifetime. So once again, this goes back to the thing I say over and over again. 1887 was a long time ago. How does that relate? No. Over and over again. And you see a continuity in history, you say, wait a second. It happened here, it happened here, it happened here, it happened here. They're talking about doing something like that again. Hmm, might happen again. 1934, Congress passed a law, part of the New Deal, to create a commission that would regulate the stock market. Kind of a big deal. You know who regulates the stock market? Stock market. <laughs> kind of. There's a commission that regulates it, appointed by the president. Big deal. I mean, we're talking about a stock market that trades trillions of dollars every year. Trillions. Kind of important entity that nobody knows. I hope they're honest, right? Isn't it great that there's these things that operate that decide so much of your life? You have no control over it. You have no control, and part of the reason you have no control is because you don't know they exist. Hard to control something if you don't know they exist, right? You actually do have control because this is a political function. So you have control, or you will when you turn 18. And remember, I'll come in you I'll tell you how to vote, and everything will be fine. It's the Partridge Hall machine. All right, so it's called the FCC. Have you ever heard of the FCC? Securities and Exchange Commission. They regulate the stock market. President George W. Bush did not believe in regulation of the stock market. So who do you put in head of the stock market? The president of Goldman Sachs. Sachs. Goldman Sachs Investment Bank. <laughs> All they do is there's stock market. I mean, that's that's what they do. They make money off the stock market. He was put in charge of the SEC. Actually, I lied. He was put in charge of the Treasury. Uh, the leading lawyer for the for Goldman Sachs was put in charge of the SEC. Fox guarding the hen house. What happened? They didn't regulate. What happened in 2008? Stock market crashed. Left a super guy 
Oh yeah, that was very conscious. They would not write lists to do what they want. No, but did the crash happen? Is that partly at least? Partly. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, because they did not regulate. They did not follow the regulation. They let things do whatever they wanted. Yeah. When was the SEC created? We'll get to it. 1933. Okay. So that's part of the New Deal. But I'm just what I'm showing you is how this stuff happens again and again. I just need to know. We will have to. It's a big. It's a big deal for the New Deal. Obviously, big deal for the New Deal. Um. Don't make that sound ever again. Who made that sound? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let me finish this then. The ICC did nothing. Who was mad? Farmers. Farmers. And so in 1888, it actually took about three years for them to realize it. 1888, Cleveland was a big disappointment to Democrats. So he's running again, Uncle Grover. Uncle Grover was running again. UG. Ugh, as we call them around the table. <laughs> Just the table. The Republicans nominated their own dark horse with a famous name and a non entity from Ohio. All these guys are from Ohio. His name, Benjamin Harrison. Harrison was much like his grandfather, considered to be very much a lightweight. Harrison had one advantage though. Some Republicans who left because of this whole Credit Mobilier scandal, some voted for Cleveland. They came back to Harrison. And Harrison had just enough to win in the Electoral College. These Republicans that were switching sides had the great name of Mudlock. Mudlock. Think about it, they're straddling the fence. Yeah, go. Cool. What's a mug? Your face is on one side of your fence, and your wump is on the other side. Mug wump. That's a good name. Mug wumps went back to Harrison. Cleveland won the popular vote. Harrison won the Electoral College. Cleveland's out. Harrison's back in. Harrison's back in. Harrison's in. But while this is going on, anger over the ICC started brewing. Serious anger. At the same time, there's labor issues that are going on and workers are feeling left behind. And then in 1888, yes. Hard to strike for farmers because they're so isolated. I know, but just if you got like, you, know, you, you, you stop producing food, that, that, that's it's kind of a big deal. Yeah, and actually, it's gonna have, something like that's going to um, happen. The problem is if you don't produce food, you starve yourself because you can't sell food. Yeah. So you've you got, got the problem farmers have. It's really hard for them to, I'm not going to work. But they don't get money in it. Yeah, a whole season. Yeah. Could they also like repossess stuff? So if they didn't like make the food they brought to them, they could just repossess the house. Yeah, they could lose yeah. the farm. But if you get a big enough strike, still though, then one year. We'll get to the populists actually yeah. talked about that, and they actually kind of did it during the New Deal. But let me get to this real quick. 1888. What state changed laws to allow for corporations to get really big? New Jersey. When New Jersey did that, all of a sudden you have merger mania, and these companies are getting bigger. At the same time. The gold standard's keeping prices down. Farmers want inflation. And so, 1890, for very much the same reason as the ICC, the feeling was, we got to do something. And so conservatives agreed to a series of laws that appeared to be not so laws I fair. Three laws. Number one, the Sherman Silver Purchasing Act. The Silver Sherman for chain. <laughs> for chain. The Silver Purchasing, or the, the Sherman Silver for chain. Ow, that hurt. <laughs> it's also called the SSPA. 
<coughs> Remember I told you about how silver had to be coined by the miner? Remember that? Well, what this did was, is it was going to buy silver. $4.5 million a month of silver. It's going to buy silver. It's going to buy silver. Butte loved it. Money poured in. It's implied that they'll coin silver with it. Farmers are overjoyed. What did they do with the silver? At first, they just kept it in the basement of the U.S. Treasury building. And then they started putting it in the basement of all the government buildings. Pretty big. Why? Why do farmers want to do this? Well, they thought the farmers would coin silver and create inflation. Prices would go up and they could get out of debt. Didn't do it. Took a very short time for farmers to realize they're mad, even though miners loved it. And also in 1890, the Sherman Antitrust Act. Remember William becomes the Sherman, the total war, the general? He, he actually passed away by then, but his brother was a very prominent senator from Ohio. He wasn't the sharpest stack, like his brother was a smart guy. John Sherman wasn't very smart, but had a prominent name. So they had him propose the bills. That's why they're called the Sherman Silver Purchasing, the Sherman Antitrust Act. Or SATA, still the law today. Trust was synonymous with monopoly. That relates back to 1888. You like how I tie everything together like a giant portrait? By the way, Uncle Grover did get married in the White House. He got married. It's a big deal. And they had a child. When a president, presidents, you know, usually don't, there's not children born in the White House. So this was a big deal. A candy company decided to take advantage of this and name a candy bar after Uncle Grover's daughter. Baby Ruth. Baby Ruth. And I don't get a penny from that. All right. Have a good day. You're a very bad. I won't count it late. It's got to be a pen. You are irresponsible. You are, you just, you, you harass people. Not enough. You need to harass me. Okay. So, would you consider yourself dependent? Sure. Yes. Now, let me ask you this. No. Oh, it's cold. It's really cold. I'm putting down you're very dependable because I'm scared. Okay. I'm intimidated. I am scary. <laughs> yeah. How many teachers do you have to do that? Five. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Can you have your money management teacher do it? No. <laughs> and I have her for two classes. Thank you. All right. Yay. See you, Mr. Parcher. See you tomorrow. Randy, you got to make a quiz. You have a thing. You know, if you're going to make up a story, at least give it a name. Go and go do it. If you need to get time, you know, it's not a big deal. It's only half your yearly grade. You'll go on your permanent record. All right.